Well, thank you everyone. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. I'm Charles Whitaker, Dean of the Medill School of Journalism, Media, Integrated Marketing Communications. Um, thank you for joining us for the second half of this discussion about the future of local news. In this session, we're focusing on what the organizers are calling emerging media. So I think that's something of a misnomer because most of the individuals we'll be speaking with actually represent some very well-established media entities. Um, and I wanted to start uh, talking to these folks about kind of asking the existential question of what's happening in local news. But let me let me introduce them first. We have uh, Chris Crewson, Executive Director of Lion, local independent online news publishers, a national nonprofit serving uh, journalism entrepreneurs. We have John Heaston, publisher of the Omaha Reader and president of our host organization, the Association of Alternative News Media. And joining us soon, I believe, will be Fannie Miller, CEO and president of San Diego's El Latino newspaper and president of the National Association of Hispanic Publications, which represents the nation's leading Spanish language news organizations. Um, and we were hoping to have Dr. Ben Chavis, President and CEO of the National Newspaper Publishers Association, a consortium of more than 200 African-American-owned newspapers. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Fanny. Glad you made it in. Thanks. So as I said, I, I wanted to start with kind of the, uh, the big existential question. Before we start talking about the future, I actually wanted to get from you folks where we are right now um, in terms of your organizations. How are you situated in the digital age? What, um, uh, yeah, what is, what is the state of the uh, entities that you represent? Chris, can we start with you? Sure. Um, so Lion Publishers has uh, a little more than 300 member news sites, mostly across the United States with a handful in Canada. Um, we, uh, it's, a, it's a tough time, but you know, the thing about Lions that's a little bit different from some of the other media we've talked about is they tend to be smaller. They tend to be lower overhead. A lot of them worked out of their homes. 60% um, of our newsrooms are for-profit and the other 40% are non-profit. So we have some overlap with organizations like INN, uh, the Institute for Nonprofit News, and AJP, the American Journalism Project, which is a kind of network that's funding many sites that are in fact Lion members. Um, it's been a rough pandemic for them. We do know that um, the recent Facebook COVID emergency relief grants, uh, about 2.7 million of that $25 million went to Lion members. I'm, um, the, several were also recipients of the Google Journalism Emergency Relief Funds, which were smaller grants of about $1,000 and went to many more of them around the globe. I know many of my members took advantage of that as well. We have seen a handful of our publishers uh, go out of business, but we've also seen a spike in people applying to join Lion and learn how to become digital publishers, which is kind of how our association is interpreting um, what's going to wind up happening in this country as legacy media continues to get smaller, um, facing even tougher headwinds than the smaller guys. We're anticipating a rise in demand and are retooling and working with some of the platforms, Google and Facebook in particular, to help um, grow and strengthen the existing ecosystem. Thank you. Ms. Miller, what's the state of the Spanish language media right now? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. So uh, NHP, the National Association of Hispanic Publications, we, we almost have um, over a little bit 200 members also. Uh, most of them are, are weeklies. We have about, I would say, probably maybe four dailies. And, um, you know, the state is, uh, uh, there's two different states between the uh, industry and then the economy. That's, so that's two different states for us. And that's the way that I see it, you know. Uh, so, you know, when, when it comes to the industry, I, I think everything that has been going on uh, within the past months with the pandemic and being at home and, you know, having to change a lot of our models and how do we do business and how, do, how we reach um, our readers, I think that has uh, uh, pushed a lot of our publishers and a lot of our members to, to be more eager into getting into the digital uh, you know, revenue and, in, uh, so we've been having, <clears throat> same that uh, Chris said, uh, uh, we've been working with Google in some trainings. Uh, we've been working with some other uh, organizations uh, in finding funds for, for the publishers. But overall, um, there's been very few uh, that I know uh, that have you know, closed or 
uh, drop their circulation uh, drastically. Uh, they changed the model a little bit. So being in the niche publications, uh, you know, minority niche, uh, most of our publications are in Spanish. Um, there's, you know, a few bilingual. So we reach that market, you know, the, the mostly the Spanish speaking market, um, that we don't have a lot of information coming our way uh, in the, you know, in the local aspect. You know, we, we have a lot of information coming our way in locally in English, but not in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the niche that a lot of our publications are, you know, have been uh, uh, doing for years and are still doing it. So, I mean, you know, when it comes to uh, digitally, I mean, we're definitely uh, up and running. Most of our uh, publishers have uh, websites and, you know, have events and do many things. Uh, but now I think it has changed a bit in paying more attention to that part of the business. I'm going to touch on that a little bit more, but first let me get to John and tell us about how the alternative uh, news media is doing these days. Well, as I think it was covered earlier, this was a kind of, the COVID was a direct hit on our, our main line of, of business, restaurant, bar, event advertising. Um, I'm really pleased to say that we um, are holding up amazingly well. Um, we uh, haven't lost um, any members. Um, we have had a, a few of our... How many members do you have now, John? 95. Um, and uh, we've had a few change hands. There were a few that uh, decided uh, time to hang up the, the spurs, um, but there was new ownership in the community that, that really stepped up. And I think the general you know, feel here, we've got fairly strong digital operations. Um, we've been able to use that to sustain us. There's a, a good mix of us that have very strong agency services. That area has actually boomed. Um, we were pretty strong in events, and, and we're making that transition to uh, the virtual. Um, almost all of us are starting some type of membership program. Um, and, you know, I think for a lot of us is let's keep a, a strong editorial light on, particularly at this time when issues we've really tried to explore and cover over the decades are, have finally kind of risen, you know, in some ways consistently to the general consciousness. Um, that our work's more important than ever and, um, and, and to keep that light on until this pandemic breaks and we can get back together again. Well, you touched on something, John, that I want to explore with each of you too, and that's the business model. You said that, you know, you folks have, have try, are trying a multi-pronged business model. Are, for, for the rest of you, uh, Kristen and Ms. Miller as well, are you largely still advertising dependent or is the business model more um, uh, uh, fluid and, and more diverse? Chris, what about your, your publication? Your yeah, I mean, I'd say, you know, for a lot of the Lions that are for-profit members, um, you know, display advertising, direct sold display advertising in particular has always been a huge part of their businesses. It's gotten more challenging, quite frankly, um, because it's typically cheaper and easier to, for a small business to advertise on a platform. And, um, you know, that's, I'd say the biggest change in the last six months in, in the membership of Lion is, a, is an, a push for membership programs and reader revenue, um, if not a subscription or a paywall. It's, um, I'd say the biggest overall life skill that a small independent publisher can have is a willingness and ability to experiment with multiple ways of driving revenue. Um, one of the projects we're working on at Lion is something called Project Oasis, which tracks the, um, the digital media ecosystem in the United States and Canada. And one of the things that I sort of expect Oasis to, to produce in terms of research is the publishers that are the most successful that identify themselves as sustainable are ones that have built lines of revenue based on a relationship with their audience. It, it echoes a lot of what we heard in the last hour from Ken and, and um, from the work that Nancy's done at the LMA. But, you know, and that John has talked a lot about in his, in his life about developing an agency business, which really is... Um, an evolution of what an advertisement in a small town newspaper used to be. You know, you could run an ad in the paper when you were a dry cleaner 50 years ago. And today, John manages a dry cleaner social media business. I mean, it's an evolution of that relationship where the small business turns to the local media provider and just says, please just figure this out for me and help me get customers in the door. Yeah. Right. And that's what an ad used to do. And that's what an agency business can do today. Ms. Miller, what about your publications? Are they still largely ad supported or are you looking at other revenue streams? No, they're, they're still likely ad supported. Uh, you know, I, I could speak 
you know, for my publication, I'm in San Diego, and 95% of my revenue comes from uh, ads. Uh, from ads. I think um, when, when we talk about other uh, business models or other revenue streams, I think it has to do with, at least with some, uh, most of our publications, it has to do with events. Uh, a lot of events that, that they do, that, that's, that's the big one. Um, and, and that's, you know, has been, we, we have all been impacted because of the events. But I think uh, descriptions and the paywall, uh, that's something new right now that it's really coming to us. Uh, uh, that it started with the pandemic. So, um, and it's something that, you know, uh, for, you know, I know a few of them that have started it, uh, doing the, the subscriptions, but we're also actually getting trained on it, um, you know, through uh, other platforms and see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, but we're not, um, we're not used to that. We're not used to charge our readers. We used to char we, we're uh, uh, used to charging our advertisers. So, that's, yeah, that's a model that we're uh, going through at this moment. John, what about the Ann, the Ann papers, the Ann publications? Are they still largely advertising supported? Um, we, had, you know, we had already diversified, you know, uh, not probably quite as well as um, the Hispanic publications into events. Um, so, you know, trying to figure out what that looks like now um, is a challenge. But... Um, our industries, our core advertising industries have also been some of the most attractive, I think, to um, um, social media. Uh, and so we have been kind of battling that. Um, but in a sense, you know, what we find out and, and to go back to this, the agency stuff we do, um, a lot of ours is built around strategy and search. Um, we get you to the top of a search when you're looking for a good or service, then you don't have to spend that much in ads. Right. Um, we don't really spend or advise our clients to spend too much time in social media because that becomes a full-time job. And if you track the analytics, the conversions um, are a challenge. Uh, it's a great engagement tool. It's a great uh, um, um, communication channel. Um, but people want to be social on social, right? Uh, they don't necessarily want to be sold to. And you can, and, and there are campaigns. Um, and so we've been doing um, kind of a mix, right? Like I think quite a few of our members are helping small businesses in their markets with their content, um, whether it's the photography they need to represent their place well, the copy they need for social media, their website, even some freelance video. Uh, it's not quite as um, advanced as what some of us are doing where we're kind of your chief digital strategist. We handle all your Yelp, Facebook, uh, Google questions. Um, and this, of course, is, has dramatically accelerated that. Yeah. And, um, you know, so there's a whole lot of experimentation, I think, going on. We're also local, you know, we're leveraging the relationships that we have mm -hmm. and, and the people that we know. And um, so those needs vary. You know, in Boston, they're, they're doing um, some virtual event business because they've got a space in the comedy scene and um, in Chicago, um, the Chicago Reader has kind of become a convening authority for local independent media in some ways, you know, yeah. the Chicago Independent Media Alliance. Um, so, you know, it, it, it is very varied, I think, by local market. I think that's true of a lot of the um, media here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll just say I kind of, uh, I'll take responsibility for the title of this panel is Emerging Media. It's not that we haven't been around, but I like to think that it's really important that independent and underserved voices um, um, are raised and elevated right now. And I think that that's the intention around the emerging. Yeah. Okay, understandable. <laughs> how, how are your publications or entities dealing with the change in media consumption? Not so much from print to digital, but from in the digital sphere, from websites to mobile. And the, the challenge with mobile is much of the stories and information that gets shared is divorced from the mothership, right? People are getting things story by story. It's atomized and pushed out there. So there's no, no affinity to the publication. It's just, you, you ask people where this story came from and they say Twitter, rather than it came from you know, the Chicago Reader or it uh, came from uh, a, a particular media entity. How are you coping with that? How is that affecting the way you think about publishing and the way you think about uh, the, the way you push stories out? 
Chris, what about your, your publication? Well, I mean, I think it, I look, I think it varies widely among members. Um, we've got members in line who've been publishing online since 2011, 2012. And um, when you operate as lean as some of these very small publishers do, you know, getting onto a new um, CMS, I mean, think about 2009, 2010, 2011, mobile, much less of a priority. And so they didn't invest in it. Right. They were invested in paying salaries for themselves, hiring freelancers, covering the news. Yeah. And the, the idea of upgrading their presence um, is the equivalent for a large publisher of a capital improvement project, mm -hmm. AKA a new press. Yeah. Um, so in the last year we've had, the, uh, the Knight Foundation ran a program, a sustainability program around grants uh, to shift publishers over to some of these new platforms like Newspack. And some of our publishers badly needed that because, you know, you have, it is the year of our Lord 2020 and websites don't load on a phone, That's right. right? Which yeah. in, in some cases in rural Vermont, which has, you know, very poor cell service, maybe that's okay. Yeah. And everyone's stuck at home now anyway, for the most part. So um, that, that line has blurred even further, but um, it's been a rocky transition. You know, part of the reason that it's, it's, um, so there's two parts of it, right? One is it's interesting that platforms are investing heavily, as, as Fanny mentioned, in training our member publishers to move away from advertising and move to subscriptions or membership. And that's interesting because the platforms have hoovered up all that advertising. It's like an 80% monopoly on mobile and 90%, right? Um, on the other hand, um, in the value proposition for a publisher, we're always going to have a higher price uh, for an ad than a pop platform will because what's on the platforms, whether it's search or social, um, the, there is no charge for that content, right? Advertising against searches, the user does the search, that's free. What, what content is on Facebook, I put there, you put there, Russian right. troll farms put there. Mm -hmm. And so that's always gonna be less expensive than hiring an, a reporter to go cover a meeting and do the news. In many cases, it's actually cheaper and more profitable to do fake news on Facebook because yeah. you don't have to pay for it than it is right. to run a real local newsroom and do the things, which is why the, this rise of kind of reader-based revenue or subscription-based revenue or philanthropy-supported revenue to make up for communities that are less, you know, less of means when readers don't have revenue, right? right. That's the giant, messy transition we're living in right now. Um, and our members, the newer members have better websites because the newer, the older members that have been able to take advantage of some of those programs or have been able to invest in that stuff, um, have done that and are upgrading that way and others haven't. I think like macro wise, what we're, what we're, what we're thinking about a lot at Lion, which in many ways is like LMA and that we're laser focused on sustainability of our members, um, is proving that local news can be a good small business. And part of that is atta like a attacking the problem as a business. There's a number of Lions that exist because they saw a need in their community they launched a news website and then they tried to figure out how to monetize it, which is an approach I would really hope we can stop have happening. Um, if only because f trying to figure out how to take an idea, uh, apply risk management to it and figure out how to make it a good business before you launch is key for some of these things that wind up happening down the line and disruptions that'll continue to happen. Nobody saw Snapchat coming. Nobody saw TikTok coming. These are all things that, you know, if you have a plan, you can plan for, but when you're operating without a plan, you're in even deeper waters. Well, in a, in a self-centered plug for my school, I will say one of the things that we are attempting to do is create sort of a management institute for emerging media people, because so often you have content producers who, as you said, Chris, don't really have business active and they haven't thought about how to monetize this. We want to sort of create a training ground for them to think more about monetization and sustainability. So we are we are in the throes of developing that as we speak. It's neat. Uh, uh, Ms. Miller, what about the move to mobile? How has that affected um, your member organizations, are they thinking about that? Are they thinking differently about content distribution um, and then the mobile platform? So I'm gonna agree with Chris uh, in pretty much everything he said. <laughs> uh, when it comes to our platforms, uh, you know, all our members, uh, nobody's in the same level. You know, everybody's in different levels. So, uh, you know, as an organization, what we're trying to do and, you know, what we, what they accomplish is to have uh, the tools. Uh, and, and, and not everybody is gonna uh, take them and some of them you know, will absorb them uh, like crazy, but everybody's in a different, um, in a different level. Uh, you know, when it comes to media consumption, so I wanna have to go back to the Spanish part of it, mm -hmm. um, is that in, in, you know, in, in Spanish, we don't, we don't get bombarded with a lot of information. 
locally um, and even even uh, nationally we don't have you know if you google I don't know um, San Diego immigration you're not going to find you know uh, 30 40 100 uh, sites that uh, cover that so it's a little different uh, with us and you know so that's the challenge that we have is how do we move to uh, these other platforms what information do we put there what information do we live in the in the print publication but we don't get vulnerated. I mean, the Hispanic community doesn't have a lot of local information. You know, uh, we have uh, national information. I mean, yeah, if you Google, you, you know, uh, something or you go on site to, you're going to find 20 sites. But what, what I really want to come back and what I keep saying to our, our members is we have to stay true to why we started the business. And that's to cover the local community. Not to cover it nationally. So it's a little different, um, you know, when it comes to media consumption and news. Uh, if you stay true to what uh, being local and highlighting, you, you know, your, your, your local uh, politicians to, high, you know, to see what they're doing, to cover them, to cover health, school, education. If you just stay with that, you know, we're not, we, we I mean, I, I've been in business for 32 years. Everything I've heard for the last probably 25 is that we're going to die, you know, and, 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 you know, I'm still here and, you know, we have a, a lot of member publications. They're still there because it's still a need. There's a need and there's a market for it. You know, if we, if the internet was going to take over the print, uh, then, you know, why are we still here? And they've been telling us that for years, you know, but I think it's also a little, it's very different when it comes to our market, you know, to when you're a niche publication, uh, there's in San Diego, which is not a very big city, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, publications, um, you know, for let, let's say for the LTGB um, um, community, it's there's like 10 publications, mm -hmm. you know, and I, uh, and there's, you know, you go to distribution and there's still, so there's, there's still a need. If you see them, of course, we have the challenges of, you know, here as information where do we put on site where do we put mobile um, uh, but I think uh, you know some of our publications are very you know up to date with the mobile and some are not even there so yeah it's it's kind of um, I always believe um, uh, that it's a different business you know so the print is a business the and the digital is a business so if you could understand both business differently, then you're going to be fine. There's some, infor there's some information and some news that you will have together that you're putting both uh, platforms and there's some news that you don't. So if you're able to choose that based on knowing your local market, then, then, uh, then you'll be fine. John, about, what about Anne and, uh, and mobile? Uh, so, um, most of our members have, have made the uh, adoption to mobile, and, and we're pretty on top of that as it happened. I'm, I might kind of be the lone exception here in Omaha, uh, but I'm, I'm working hard to catch up, um, and we are going to be testing Newspack out here pretty soon. You know, I, I would like to just add to Fanny's comments. Here in Omaha, we've got five, uh, at least, uh, Latino publications targeting the Latino market. It, it's clearly the fastest growing market in our community. It's over a majority of the public school kids now. Um, and you know, once those kindergartners graduate from high school, the numbers are even bigger. Um, and so, you know, I've, I'm seeing a lot of fascinating things. You know, the thing that makes me think about mobile, mobile's uh, challenging for the long form journalism that we like, right? It's a heck of a lot of scrolling. Um, <laughs> but you want to, but when, when people are on mobile, the bulk of their time is really spent on social. And so how do we capture people's interest? And I think that's where you're seeing more and more kind of experimentation. Um, I see it a lot within uh, NAHP. Um, one of our, uh, the other newspaper here in my market that we respect the most, uh, Mundo Latino, she started a daily 10-minute uh, news broadcast, highlight news, professional background, looks great. There's a number like Elevizo and, and Los Angeles is doing some great um, almost micro TV kind of things, El Informador and Charleston. Um, and I think you'll see some more of that kind of coming. We're starting to experiment with the sound grams and, and how do we create that kind of engaging content that's really shareable on social that brings them back. 
right? How can we throw out those fishing lines? Yeah. Pull them to our site um, where we obviously have a chance to convert them as members and, and you know, place an app. I think that's the key, again, as you said, throwing out fishing lines that'll bring them back. Because you're right, mobile is used differently than sort of either websites or print. So yeah, how do you keep them attached to the mothership um, while, they're, while they're on mobile and, and on social? Um, Chris, um, as I look at the Lion website, it looks like, you know, one of the things you are most devoted to, or one of the things you're particularly devoted to, devoted to is um, promoting entrepreneurship uh, among people of color. Um, and yet still one of the greatest barriers to um, any small business uh, started by people of color is access to capital. Um, and so, you know, when you talk about sustainability, most of them are dying because they're so undercapitalized at the start. How are you addressing that? Um, well, I can talk about some of that and some stuff I'll have to save for another day because it's not re ready to be announced, but it is okay. very much in our plans. The, the, yeah. One of the first things we're doing is uh, we partnered with the Google News Initiative on the North American Startups Lab, where we have a cohort of 24 uh, incredible founders who are just in the first steps of uh, the media entrepreneurship journey. We looked really hard for people. And this, this program, by the way, will, ru will run in two parts. The first half is an intense eight-week boot camp to do uh, the opposite of what I said earlier, which was kind of ready, fire, aim a publication. Instead, it's an eight-week process to go from idea to prototype. And the, the whole point is to de-risk your idea. I think too many of these media startups start off in stealth mode and there's, you know, a reporter for city hall and a reporter for business. And we're going to cover high school sports. And then there's, Oh, by the way, one person on the side who does all the ads and the website and like somehow magically pays 10 people's salary. How does that work? Right? So um, the goal of this boot camp, which is the first phase of the lab is to take your idea and de-risk it, you know, run a concept by your audience before you launch it engage what kind of appetite there is for the products and services you might offer and the kinds there, of advertisements you might run, right? There is an if we build it, they will come mentality. That and that's, so that, you know, <laughs> having worked for a local startup that had to sell itself in pieces because it was not sustainable, nothing makes you more passionate about sustainability than not being able to continue to run a site that you turned on. And I turned on two and I don't operate either one anymore. Yeah. So, um, the second half of the of the lab is an eight is an intense six month um, incubator program, and tomorrow we're going to announce who we hired to run this program. Um, it is uh, really aimed at supporting those founders. We're going to take the, of the twenty four that go through that first eight week, we'll choose sixteen to move on to the sort of um, six month you know intense incubator to really train them and go from prototype to launch. You know, it's, so the the whole process goes from idea to launch. Um, we had 260 applications for this program, which speaks to a far larger demand than we anticipated. We thought we'd get 100 because there were 24 spots. And instead, we had 10 times, you know, we, 10 times the amount of demand as for spots that we had in the program. Um, obviously, I hope we can continue to do this program with Google support. We'll put 24 this year. If we do two more next year, which is kind of the tentative plan, then we will have run about 75 entrepreneurs through a program to help strengthen their ideas with Google's blessing and Google's help and Google's kind of stamp of approval on their projects, which should prove useful as they go out there and try to raise money from readers in their communities or from other people interested in supporting what they do. I think that's the part of the ecosystem that we know we're committed to building. Um, we're trying to develop other programs right now, and I'll be able to talk about them soon, that really aim to do those things, lower the risk, lower the cost, increase access to tools, and then try to find funding to support those entrepreneurs as they take that step. And really, that's, um, that's the formula that I hope we can, um, we can ar arrive on and find support for, because that's, I think, what's going to wind up making the difference is, is just taking advantage of the, of the ability of the internet to connect people and provide them with that stuff. Um, the Oasis research uh, by January, I think we're going to launch something called the Starter Pack, which is a comprehensive um, group of tools to allow entrepreneurs to see what other people have done. Job descriptions for reporters, for salespeople, business plans, pitch decks, all the stuff that we can find, we're going to publish and have it searchable and sortable so you can see what others have done and make and de-risk and demystify that process. There's a lot of information on the internet about how to start a business, but there's not enough about how to start a local news business. And that's the gap that we're moving to fill right now. Oh, interesting. Very good. Uh, John, any, any um, issues in your membership or among potential members with 
access to capital, starting uh, get, getting publications growing, and are is Anne helping with that? Uh, that space is something Lions really kind of in, and so you know I think our focus is how do we help our existing members make that transformation and how do we lead uh, the, the paradigm shift in journalism in our communities and help bring those other voices to the table? Um, I can say that um, as a group, I think we um, seem to have paid very close attention to the CARES Act mm -hmm. and um, took advantage of the programs that are gonna help us kind of get through this. So in that sense, um, you know, we, we did get access to capital. We have established banking relationships, almost all of us. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, when we talk about entrepreneurism, right, I, I started my publication 26 years ago, got into publishing 28 years ago, uh, and, you know, I've had to reinvent um, uh, what we're doing. And I see that happening across. So I think there's you know, there's that startup space and there's a lot of holes and a lot of deserts and a lot of places to fill. But, you know, one of the things that I feel like we share with the National Association of Hispanic Publication and the, and the National Newspaper uh, Publishers Association, the Black Press, is that we've got operators who have not had the benefits of a, an industrial printing press or a broadcast license and who have built multi-generational sustainable businesses have built equity, remain local and independent. Um, and so kind of along those lines, we, we actually have something kind of exciting that we should share. Um, and I should probably let Fanny share that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, what was the question, Charles? Did, did you talk well, about, you? about access to capital? John turned it into entrepreneurship in general. And how are you promoting entrepreneurship? And he says, you have an exciting announcement to make. Yeah. So, uh, so, so my, my wish is to be like Chris and John, you know, that they seem to know where all the programs are, where all the funding is, all the opportunities, because I think that has been our challenge, at least, you know, when I came on board a couple of years ago and been trying to catch up. But I think now with, you know, being at home and everything that we've been through in the last months, uh, it's, I don't know if it's just opportunities that I, we never saw opportunities that we never took advantage or we just were so busy running our businesses that uh you know that we never paid attention so i think that's uh, been something you know at least new to me and you know john has really you know helped uh, uh kind of help me catch up uh, with a lot of the opportunities uh, that, that that we're having most of our publications well at least i know that by experience um you know there's not too many banks that are going to lend us money when you're in print and when you're in a, a newspaper. It's, uh, I believe it's the two hardest businesses, restaurants and uh, newspapers that, you know, they kind of stay away from you. So, yeah, I mean, uh, from some of the publications that were formalized and had all their paperwork and they were running their business as a business, did were able to take care of, you know, a benefit from the CARE Act. I mean, uh, but some were not, you know, some didn't have uh, all their stuff together. And that just in our, in our industry, but in many, many different, uh, uh, yeah, many different industries uh, that happened to a lot of small businesses. So, you know, what, what, what my goal is to do with NHP is to kind of, you know, uh, get on my brain and, and, and bring the resources that John and Chris have in their, you know, hands and, and everything that they're doing, because they're doing some great things. Um, and, you know, we, we've been so behind in it. And, and what I'm saying is some of, I mean, not everybody, but at least as the organization it is, I mean, I've kind of been putting the stones to the organization uh, in the, couple, the last couple of years. But, uh, you know, since uh, John knows so much better how the program is going to run, I'm going to let him talk about it. <laughs> Wait a well, minute. Um, <laughs> The AAN, NAHP, and NNPA uh, are working together on a um, underrepresented publishers digital transformation lab. Uh, so this is a program um, with Google News Initiative. Um, I'm, I'm really excited um, about how Google brings a team to the local media ecosystem and does their research. Um, and that's how we kind of finally got on their radar. 
we didn't really have any relationships. We had kind of heard about it, you know, they're more than happy to give you a news lab, but to really get into that deeper conversation is something um, the three of our organizations have been working on. So we're really excited to announce that. We're looking at anywhere from 25 to 35 publishers um, that uh, will be in the first lab. We're, we're putting the details of the program together now. Um, there is also some support for uh, digital specialists um, within each of the three associations. Um, in, within Anne, we'll focus a bit on collaboration. That kind of seems to be one of our biggest contributions and, and uh, things we can do in this space. And so that should be announced soon uh, and we should be taking applications. Uh, we are also partnered with, um, sorry, Charles, uh, the City University of New York. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, and um, uh, the Borealis Philanthropy. And so um, much like Chris, we expect this to be kind of the vanguard of how we can serve more members and having some of those people in-house are going to give us some of those resources to serve those members. Um, you know, this group, and, and I'm sorry, Dr. Chavis uh, uh, hasn't joined us, and um, I, um, so I've tried to catch him, but um, he is probably 10 times busier than all of us because he is a busy man, he, yes. He's just an icon. Yeah. Um, uh, but this group got involved very early on when the pandemic hit in bringing funders to the table and talking about what the local media ecosystem needs. Um, and so I can't say enough about what Chris has done, what Fannie has done, you know, what NNPA has done in bringing awareness to that whole media ecosystem, that news media ecosystem. And I think you saw some of the fingerprints of that work in the emergency relief funds that came out. Um, so I think that was able to reach a lot of folks. Um, but you're seeing that, um, uh, you know, uh, the conversation is expanding, and, um, and and we hope to keep kind of opening those doors. And um, uh, you know, all that is shiny and new. <laughs> you know, uh, we're, we're we've got brands well known in our communities that've been around for decades, and um, there's there's a lot of room in this whole area for how we got to support local media and serve our communities. Uh, and I'm glad that there's just more people at the table now. We can't talk about the future of uh, local news or, or journalism in general without talking about what can or should be done to recruit more young people, particularly black and brown young people, to the field. Um, we have not done, none of us, uh, with the exception of Fanny, uh, has done a particularly good job at this uh, uh, going in, the, in the past. And the news, about, the news about the news business is so bad that young people are discouraged or either discouraged by their parents and influences or others to go in, or they have heard such bad stories about the experiences of their predecessors that they are reluctant to go into this business. What are we collectively or individually doing to address that? Um, anyone can start. Fanny, how's, the, how's recruitment of young talent going for you? You know, I always say, if you get into this business, it's not because you want to become a billion, okay? <laughs> so let's start from there. Uh, you know, uh, we do are going to work more uh, with the youngs and, you know, having more internships. And, you know, I have not really done a, a, a well good job. It takes, it takes patience uh, to work with, uh, with, you know, with the youth and to train them. And, and, and you, you have to have a... Um, uh, you, you have to have people within your organization to do that. I know that there's some of the publications, um, maybe in some of the bigger markers, that do have a lot of interns and, and work with a lot of interns. I think the discouragement gets when the interns go in, work for uh, uh, publications, even broadcast and other um, media, and then uh, they, don't, they, they never get hired. You know, uh, that, I think that's, that's the, the problem, that they go, they put all their passion, and you know, and they're uh, and they're done. Uh, and very few of them actually do get hired. So I need. I think we need to. I don't think there's a lack of passion, youth, mm -hmm. um, but um, there is a lack of 
you know, actually hiring them and also the pay, you know, to make sure that they are getting paid, um, you know, what, what they're worth and also teaching them how to, uh, you know, ask for uh, what you're worth because there's a lot of good talent. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm part of a Latinas in journalists and um, in Facebook in a group and, you know, I see those ladies and they're just very talented. So, you know, I think it's not a lack of passion that they have. I think it's, it, it's, it's, not not uh, them, you know, for them to stay within the companies. And a lot of the smaller publications, you know, maybe we're not um, the structure that we have. Now they don't feel like they're going to be able to advance much. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, so th there's a different when it comes to the different uh, organizations and all the different media. You know, when I say media, it's you know the uh, the print, the broadcast, uh, you know, radio. Uh, in San Diego, we have a lot of radio. We don't have a lot of, um, you know, Spanish. I think there's more in Omaha than there is in San Diego in Spanish, which I'm not complaining. You know? <laughs> but uh, but but there's uh, but there is a, 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 a I see a lot of uh, lay, a, a lot of youth and a lot of that do want to go into the the uh, you know the media, the journalists. But I, I think it's our fault that we you know I think sometimes we just burst their bubble in. In, in killing that passion. So, uh, and I think that passion is going to be, um, you know, taken care of when they go into a, uh, a company that that they're able to uh, be free about what they're, you know, writing, where, you know, they're being mentored uh, in a way that, uh, that they, you know, they feel that they're growing in their careers. But there's a lot of talent and, and I think it comes, it's not them, I think it's us, the companies that are not giving yeah. them what they need. I agree. Chris, your thoughts? Bring in your Well, yeah, look, I, you know, I teach, uh, I teach journalism at Temple University. I have for the last five or six years. I teach a course called Newsroom Management. And, you know, the decline line has been in the overall large local media companies. Um, yeah. that, that path doesn't exist anymore. Exactly. And so, you know, when I look at what Lion's role is over the next few years, I, I want to grow the ecosystem. There's about 525 active digital sites uh, in the U.S. and Canada. There are about 6,700 newspapers. So, you know, we're outnumbered in terms of uh, uh, an industry that has sort of jobs and, and clout and things like that. What has to happen, what, I'm, what I'd love to see is a doubling or tripling over the next few years of that space. And we're trying to encourage entrepreneurs um, to go out there and start those things, be the owners that their communities need, be the media that reflects their community from the beginning and build it. You know, it takes, it takes twice as much effort to tear something down and rebuild it as it does to build it right from the beginning. So I think we have this huge opportunity now um, to sort of to sort of be that um, mm -hmm. facilitator at Lion, um, one of the specific things I'm trying to get funded at Lion is something called the Lion Prize. I would love it if a, a college had a media entrepreneurship <laughs> class and we Shark Tanked it for a semester, where a student would go in following this very similar things I talked about through the Google program, where you walk in with an idea and you walk out with a product. Imagine that unfolding over the course of a semester, and the best, the winning idea in that class getting enough funding for three months, six months, a year to go out there and start making money in that field. And I'd love for Lion to help make that happen, but I don't think it's a, a next month or next year project for us to do. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I would say is that, you know, uh, a little while ago, Josh Benton wrote a, a piece for Neiman Lab about how it was the responsibility of the New York Times to save local journalism, which I thought was a lot of what comes out of the back end that are going to wind up working at the New York Times in five to 10 years are going to start somewhere. And where they're going to start are Lion members, right? They're going to, because what used to be in the middle, exactly. my career path, I started at a small newspaper. I moved up to a mid-sized newspaper and then I went to the Philadelphia right. Inquirer. Yeah, that yeah, path right. doesn't exist exactly. anymore or won't in the next five right. years, right? Those places are consolidating. They're not hiring. And yes. what is growing are people who operate sites now or people who are going to start those sites. And there's a woman who runs a, a site in California called uh, the Oakland side. Her name is Tisney Raja, and her career path is the career path of the future. You know, she started out in Tisney all Tisney Raja is a former Ann um, fellow, so I know Tasneem very well. <laughs> she started out, Tasneem is great. She started out, you know, in alt weeklies. She, she started out the Chicago NPR, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And she moved to NPR, right? She ran <laughs> um, Code Switch. Yeah. And then she started a lion site. She started yeah. the Tyler Loop and represented yeah. us at conferences. And now she moved up to a much larger, um, well-funded, well-capitalized uh, startup in, in Oakland, California. She's and a brilliant young woman. Yeah. That's the kind of career path that we need to be, you know, 
helping make more explicit. Mm -hmm. And some of that's going to be on people deciding they want to go out there and starting something that covers their neighborhood. And so that's right. what Lion is positioning ourselves to kind of help in that transition and then figuring out when we have a thousand of these sites, 2000 of these sites across the country, how do they, like, what is, what is the ladder system work like? What does the support network look that looks like? And, and Charles, it sounds like the program you're talking about is designed to help in that framework as well, where it's very sorely needed. This is the system. Local newspapers didn't exist by themselves. There were whole ecosystems that fed those things with sports scores, with legislation updates, and all that needs to be reconfigured. We need to lean on AI to do some of that. We need to lean on, you know, philanthropy to do some of that. Colleges, universities are going to play a role in that. That's what we have to really build and support over the next few years, because that's what the future is. So, great. so John, yeah, yes, Tasneem is a product of the old Academy for Alternative Journalism that, uh, that came out of, of Medill and Ann. And, but Ann had not been considered for a long time. The Ann publications had not been considered friendly places necessarily for, for people of color. And there were very, very few, which is why we started the Academy for Alternative Journalism to begin with. What's, what's happening now? How are you addressing that? How are you identifying, grooming the next generation of talent and particularly uh, people of color? So um, I, I think there's a couple of things, and it's something that as we've kind of navigated the uh, revenue question is kind of high on our list, right? Because one of the other big things, and I think that's true for us and um, uh, some of the older Lion members, certainly quite a few NAHP and NNPA members, is succession, mm -hmm. right? What does succession look like? And, and how do we um, bring that next level of talent on that's going to serve the community and, and create that kind of transition? And so, you know, there's a number, you know, not only looking at the nonprofit model, but I think we've got some emerging co-op models uh, that are in play. I know it's something that we're going to be looking at, you know, here in Omaha. We've been pretty fortunate because we lead in that collaboration to attract some of that talent. Um, and it's not as much as, as we need, but... Um, we're making some good inroads. I think there's also, um, and, and I'm, I'm kind of just theorizing for myself, we haven't really had these conversations as an association maybe, but what I would encourage us to think about, one of the strengths of, of our media um, is that we are very open to freelance contributors and we're very open to a lot of different voices. And so I, I'm trying to explore the idea of what is our role almost as the talent agency for that emerging talent? not only will I give you a spot to publish, but how do I help you become your own voice in the community? And when it comes time and you've got some traffic, how do I help you monetize that, right? And so it, you know, I'm trying to, in some ways, get past the traditional employer-employee relationship. And how do we build real equity in this space? Because I think um, youth are seeing the power of that video camera in their pocket. The biggest stories of our day are often broken um, that start there. And so I find, um, you know, there's a real interest in citizen journalism. There's a real interest in this kind of community journalism, documenters programs. Um, how do we um, start seeding that, giving that talent an opportunity to cut their teeth, um, you know, and, and hone their skills? Um, so that they can grow. Now, I mean, in some ways, you know, uh, we're always going to be the feeder team <laughs> for the big nationals, right? Like, you can go to the New York Times, who's going to turn that down, right? You know, we, Willamette Week just lost a reporter to the uh, one of their award winners to the Washington Post. Um, but we're proud of that. That That's a, you know, a real mark for us, you know. We, we, well, but the reality is they're not that many big feeders left, as Chris said, you know, the, yeah. the career path that he and I went on, you know, you know, I started the Miami Herald and then so, Louisville and then blah, blah, blah. That doesn't exist right. anymore. So, so we're going to be feeding them to a lot. I mean, some of them will go to those big things, but some of them will have to go to something else. And I think we've got to figure out what that something else is. Yeah. yeah Fanny. Sure. So just what, what uh, Chris was saying about, you know, starting your own business and starting your own site. And uh, so I started, I started at Latino when I was 21 you know, back in 88, okay, so uh, you know my age by now, but um, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any, you know, I didn't have any money, I didn't have any experience, I didn't have, uh, 
you know, it, I didn't even have a formal education at the time. So everything was new. Uh, and there was a group of us, yes, there were six of us. And because it's, you know, we didn't know. I mean, I was 21, you know, it's like, it's like what they say, uh, give a job to the youth because, you know, they'll do anything, right? right. So uh, I did it and it was an opportunity. So I think, you know, at least my, my experience helps other youth uh, be able to say, hey, you know, uh, do it. I mean, it's not easy, like no business is easy, but it's doable. And, you know, you just have to, you know, get involved. It's, it's, it's not working from nine to five for sure, you know. We know that and, um, uh, and don't expect to, you know, get paid the high numbers um, at the beginning, but it's doable, uh, opening your own business. And a lot of the publications have done that, you know. And, and with the Hispanic publications, it's interesting on the business side because um, a lot of them, you know, are, are um, journalists. They're not business people. So I think that has been the little shift on now that, okay, I got to become a journalist people. See, with me, it's been kind of the other way. I, you know, I believe myself as a business people. And then, you know, and, and then I hired the journalist, um, you know, part of it. So, so you just have to know, but it's a doable, yes. And it's, you know, um, just like any business and there's a, a lot of need, you know, in certain communities, there's a lot of need, but you have to stay true to the, the, your community and the reason that you start that business. But, but mentorship is the key. I mean, I think, you know, as Chris was suggesting, you know, we can't build a lot of things badly and then have them implode. I think we've got to provide these folks with the skills, the tools, the guidance so that they are building it right the first time and we are not kind of blowing these things up and, you know, uh, so that the flowers actually can bloom and we act, we don't have these but, things. But, you, but you're going to make mistakes. Oh, you're absolutely. No, absolutely. A lot absolutely. of mistakes. That's and, thing. And, That's and, right. and sometimes if you wait until you're totally ready, you'll never start. No, we're not saying to, you know, <laughs> put things on pause until you're yeah. ready but again if they can have some guidance we can we can have a, a more robust and flourishing ecosystem and not one uh, that's full of a lot of struggling uh entities that are barely you know making it and then kind of going and, away after, after and mentoring is the key i you Absolutely. know I, I was mentor i you know i when i went into the nhp i mean I was like 23 years old, you know, I think the young was was like in 40s uh, and they were, they all, I mean, I pick everybody's brain, I talk to everybody, I learned a lot, you know, from them. I learned how to hire, fire, how to, you know, pay for distribution, how to, uh, how to sell, you know, all that, the, the demographics. So it's been an, everything that I, that I know I have learned it from scratch and you have to be, you know, uh, get involved with organizations. That's very important. So we're winding down. Um, I just wanted to give each of you a chance, sort of your final thoughts about, you know, the future and, and, and where we're headed with, uh, with, with media, particularly your organizations right now. Chris, what are, what are you excited about? What do you, what do you think uh, the future holds? Well, you know, it's budget season. And uh, so uh, I'm not excited about that, but, um, but I think it does point to, um, you know, some concrete things uh, that are in the future for Lion. We're, like I said, we're about to uh, announce our next full-time hire uh, tomorrow in our newsletter. Um, that's attached to the Google program. We'll, we'll have brought on one full-timer and one part-timer to sort of, um, to grow that. I'm excited for that relationship, which really has transformed Lion in the past year. Um, I'm excited to... Um, Forgive me, Chris, how old is Lion? Lion was started in 2012, okay. uh, became, hired its first executive director in 2015, uh, became a C3, and I came on last year right around the same time. So we, we actually uh, have grown up a lot in that time period, but we went from you know, one full-time employee with some contractors in 2019, and we'll end this year with um, at least seven full-time employees. So it's a period of, of growth for Lion Publishers, the association. Uh, we started this year with 177 members. As of today, we're at 310. So the, our ranks are growing. Um, and I, you know, I think what our job is is pretty clear. You know, we need to help start more things and help strengthen the things that exist. I think in that order, um, I think there need to be a, many more experiments. Um, and I think the thing that has changed in that calculation that the rest of the industry has understood is that you know, COVID has been an accelerant to the already existing collapse in local newspaper media um and what's you know the logical thing that exists now we need to sort of strengthen these like small furry mammals that are running around in the shadow of the dinosaurs 
So um, with that metaphor, you know, that's that very uplifting metaphor. That's uh, that's how, what I think. Annie, what are you excited about? What's what's the future hold for your publications? What's uh, there, there's definitely a lot of uh, to get excited about. I mean, um, first for the NHP, I would love to hire a full-time director, <laughs> you know, somebody to take over a lot of the uh, uh, job that I'm doing and, you know, and, and, and I want to do it better, but time does not allow me to. Uh, we want to bring a lot of resources to the members, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, like right now I have learned so much from Chris, you know, things that I'm doing from John. Uh, from the uh, previous um, uh, panelists. Uh, so bring out all of the resources to the members and make sure that the members know about it. You know, when, when the, uh, uh, there was a Facebook, uh, the, the journalist grants, and then there were some on Google, a lot of the publications missed it mm -hmm. because they, they, they didn't know about it, you know? Right. Uh, so I want to be able to bring, you know, a lot of, a lot of those under the same umbrella where, you know, we're also helping them go through the process if, 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 they, if they need help. So that's one, one of the things that I'm excited about. Um, you know, we are doing our conference this week, so as soon as I get out, I'm going to have to go into the other one. Um, but um, I'm also, um, um, you know, we want to strengthen the members, you know, and have more of, uh, I, at least I've been trying to, and I think I have accomplished uh, a lot, in, in especially now with the pandemic, uh, being able to talk to them directly and see where they are and, you know, what they need. Uh, I, you know, having conversations on one-on-one -on -one emails, uh, I have made myself available to them and because they also have, uh, they, they, there's, they, there is definitely a lot of help needed. Um, but that there's also a lot of resources. So kind of we need to put two, those two together. Uh, when it comes to our publications, you know, we're not going to die. We're still here. We're still going to be here. Uh, what we have to do is we have to monetize, get our brains with all the digital. And, you know, we have done a really good job in the events uh, area. You know, I put the largest Latina conference in Spanish nationwide here in San Diego. And, you know, now I don't know how I'm going to do it virtually. It's not the same. Um, when it's in a hotel and a thousand women, it seems easier for me than that doing it this way. I don't understand it. So, but we have to come together and just help our, uh, help our members better, help um, uh, get the, you know, get the Google, get the Facebook, get, you know, all these organizations and all these corporations to, yes, you know, work with us. And, um, you know, uh, we're the ones making the news for them. So uh, there's a lot of interesting conversations that are going to be going on and they are going on and just making at least my members part of it. John, we're just about out of time. Did you want the last word? Yeah, I'll just say thanks to everybody. This is what we want to do. We want to elevate the diversity of this local media space, uh, revenue diversification, and really stepping forward in this moment because it's disruption and it should be our time. I want to thank everybody. Thank you thank all. You. Chris, thank you. it was great meeting you. Take care. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Bye-bye.